Hey, welcome to another weekend message. I'm Pastor Bill Thomas at Hereford Faith and Life Church, and I'm so glad you're with us. Uh, I'm excited about uh, what God's doing uh, in the world today, and uh, I know some things look pretty bleak, but I tell you what, God's in control, and uh, your life might be spinning the same way, and I just want to encourage you, uh, put your faith uh, in our Heavenly Father. He's our rock and fortress. Uh, he's our defense. He's our protector. He's our healer, deliverer, savior, and redeemer. And there's no one like Jesus Christ. And so I'm glad you're here. I hope you have your Bible open and maybe a notebook, a uh, pen to take some notes and uh, want to continue in our series. But first, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this group of people who are watching your word. I pray, Lord, that you would touch all of us, that you would encourage us, that you would heal us, that you would, uh, again, uh, take care of every single need that we have. Uh, Lord, you're more than adequate and you're more than ready. Uh, all we have to do is pray. So, Lord, I, again, I pray that your Holy Spirit would teach us and it would uh, your word would find good, good soil in our hearts that we might believe and act upon the word and bear much fruit for you, for your glory the kingdom. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me share a screen with you. You know, I like to use uh, PowerPoint. It helps me uh, uh, kind of share. Plus, I'm a visual learner. Some of us are audible. Some of us are visual. Uh, you know, we've all failed God. You know, think about it. We, we, we've all let God down. We've had moments when we caved into temptations, and We've had encounters when we were less than open about our faith in Christ and, in essence, uh, denying him before co-workers or people we meet. Sometimes we actually worry about what people may think about us, uh, what others do. I remember hearing a story about two businessmen who started business together. They worked together for about 20, 25 years. One of them went to a Billy Graham crusade and, and, and got saved and he was so excited. He just didn't know how to explain it to his friend, but he did. He decided, I'm going to go in and and share. And that day at work, the next day, he he comes in and he, he just said, look, I got to tell you something amazing happened. I went to Billy Graham. You know, he's in the city last night. I gave my life to Christ. And the partner jumps up out of his seat and says, praise God. I'm so happy for you. I, I'm a Christian too. I gave my life to Jesus when I was in college. And his partner's face drops. And he says, what? You, you, you've been a Christian all this time we've been together. We've taken business trips together. Our families have vacationed together. We play golf together every Thursday. And you never thought about telling me about Jesus Christ? His partner kind of hemmed and hawed. Well, I, I, I didn't want to offend you or think I was better than you. He, says, he said, well, listen, you're the reason I didn't give my life to Jesus earlier. I looked at your life. You had it all together, happy home, successful. And I thought if you didn't need Jesus in your life, I didn't either. That's why I waited so long. Well, folks, that, that's a major fail, isn't it? And I hope there's no one in our lives who would say that to us. So let's ask the question, what, what is it that trips you up? Where in your life is that chief source of failure, your weakest link in your armor? What's your Achilles heel? That's a critical question to be addressed. We've been studying the disciple Peter these past weeks in a series called Falling, Failing, and Rising Again. But we have one more stop to examine before we conclude our study. Last Sunday, I hope you took a look at last week's message, the marvelous exchange between Jesus and Peter. Jesus asked Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? And we discovered how Jesus meets us and accepts us right where we are. It made me think of the great hymn, you know, mentioned Billy Graham, that remember how he closed out his crusades? He'd sing that, they'd sing that song, Cliff Barrows would lead the singing, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bids me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, just as I am, tossed about with many conflict, many doubts, fighting fears with an out. O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as I am, thou wilt receive, will welcome, pardon, cleanse, re relieve, because thy promise, I believe, O Lamb of God, I come. Jesus meets us right where we are. Jesus asked Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? Giving Peter the opportunity to purge and cleanse his wounded conscience from his three denials. 
But the very first question Jesus asks is phrased a little different than the next two. And I want us to look at that. John chapter 20, verse 15, this is Jesus' first, break, uh, first question. After breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And I told you last time, we would look at this phrase more than these. Peter, do you love me more than these? The obvious question is, what, more of these what? Right? What, what are the these that Jesus is referring to? And, and here's the stickler. The question isn't answered. Peter responds, yes, and the exchange moves on. Do you love me more than these? What are the these Jesus is referring to? I believe there's at least three possible interpretations of what Jesus was asking Peter. And all three have merit in addressing uh, our response when we fall and fail God. The first could be when Jesus asked Peter, do you love me more than these? Jesus may have been looking at the fishing nets, the fishing gear that Peter was tending to. Remember, if you read that account, G Peter had backed away from the fellowship around breakfast with Jesus. And uh, Jesus said, uh, go get some of the fish you just got. It was Peter who walks along the shoreline and probably didn't come back. Having denied him, this was a tough time. He wanted to avoid the awkwardness and the discomfort when he had turned his back on Jesus in Jesus' deepest time of need. And in this deep regret, added insult to injury, Peter had gone back to his old way of life, to fishing. And remember, he said he wasn't very good at it, but maybe Jesus was asking Peter, Peter, every time you fail and you fall, are you going to give up and run back to your old way of living? Run back to what's familiar to you and comfortable to you. Do you love me more, more than these things, your, your, your old life, your old vocation? Man, you put a group of men together, particularly, and tell them to get to know each other and give them one restriction. You cannot talk about your work or occupation. <laughs> I've done it several times. The room is dead silent. Why? For most men and, and probably people in general, we, we've bought into the lie that our value and esteem, our identity is based on our job, our career, what we do for a living. And this is a huge area of failure for all who place their identity, self-worth, and value in their occupation and job title. Jesus said, Peter, do you love me more than being a fisherman? Do you love me and, and, and more? And do you find yourself in value in loving me and being a disciple? Or do you love me more than your occupation and career? That, that, that's a powerful question. He asked the same question to us. Do you love me more than your career? Not only do we wrap our identities around our vocations and titles, but it's our oftentimes our job and careers that cause us to fail God. Not that we're doing sinful things at work, but work can drain our lives. The hours and busyness, the worries and concerns that keep us distance from not only God, but also our family and our spouses. I mean, you're sitting at the dinner table, the kids are sharing their day, but you're not there. You're physically there, but your thoughts are at work. You've got things left undone, things you need to attend to, maybe at a disagreement with a coworker, maybe even the boss. And work, I know, can suck up our time. I mean, some people are just too busy to work to really be a disciple. So, so radically following Christ gets put on the back burner because work has become our priority. There's no time to pray or do Bible study or do small group or Sunday mornings, wow, well, you forget that. So one day I get to, to really sleep in. It's my day. Listen, if you're pressed about it, our responses sound the same. Honey, I, you know, I, I know I work long hours, but I need the money. We need the money. I, I, I know what we're, I'm away from home office. It's my job. We have to keep this house and the cars and all that comes in. And, and, and look, the kids, we, we want to, them to go to successful colleges. And that means I have to climb the top of the corporate ladder and it's going to cost us all. And Lord, in a few more years, I'll have the security of retirement. And I can really, really follow you and serve you then. <laughs> and you just have to think, really? <laughs> Isn't it our job to nurture our spouse and raise our kids for Christ? To reach our community for the Lord and build the kingdom of God? Listen, God will often let you do that in and through your job. But your job is never your first calling. It's not your first priority. Our first job is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. See, life is really all about having Jesus first. 
the Lord of our lives in everything. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, what things that we are consumed about will be added to you. That's in Matthew 6, 33. And that word seek in the Greek is an active voice. It means it's an ongoing action, always seeking God first. That means it's not just a one-time commitment, not by signing a, a card. It's a lifestyle of seeking first things first, Jesus. And Jesus is asking each one of us right now, do you love me more than these? And for Peter, he was pointing at the fishing boats and, and nets. Right now, he's pointing at your career. Your job, your traveling, your expenses, your house, your cars, all that comes with it. Do you love me more than these? When I finished my student teaching, ready for a full-time job teaching, uh, there was no work anywhere in the in the county. I, I was trying to be an art teacher, but there were no openings. And Linda and I got married. I, I worked for the YMCA for a while. Linda worked for the college dean as a secretary. We both substitute school. I mean, we were poor as poor could be. And I was always waiting. I had filed my application and teach to several places, and we lived on very little for a long time. And then one day I got the call from the Carroll County office building with an interview for a job opening for art at Westminster High School. And that's where I did my student teaching. So I went in and, and I got the job. I was hired. And just like that, we went from living poor to living large. <laughs> All the years of college and waiting and waiting for the door to open. And it did. I had a regular salary, a health benefits, pension, bought a little townhouse in Tawny Town, and <clears throat> we were the living the life now. And just months before my second year teaching, full time was coming to an end. And that's a real critical time. If you're a teacher, you know that after two years in Carroll County, you, you get tenure. And that, that means I would have security, job security for the rest of my life. That's when God began to impress Linda and I that I was to be a pastor. And we were scratching our heads saying, what in the world, God, is that all about? I mean, this is what I trained for. This is what I wanted. I was coaching. I was touching lives. Kids, both of us were with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, loving it all. And just, just months away from having job security for the rest of my career, Jesus asked, Bill, do you love me more than these? Teaching art, coaching. Do you love me more than tenure and security? Do you love me more than your salary and your benefits that you're enjoying now? Do you love me more than these? And I'll be honest with you, for Linda, it was a real struggle. It was brutal for us because we had gone this length of time with so little. And so we began to have lots of prayers and conversations together with others who, who know us well. And we finally, Linda and I said, yes, we do. And I call it retirement. I retired after two years of teaching. We sold our small small townhouse. That paid for it. my first year at seminary. Went to Kentucky. Went to school at Asbury Theological Seminary. I pastored two little country churches. I had a total salary that included housing and travel, $4,000 a year. No health benefits, no pension, no security. But we were exactly where God wanted us to be. Yes, Lord. We love you more than these. Now, I know some of you, you've made the same kind of decisions. You, you've left jobs. You've turned down promotions because your call to be a disciple and to raise your family came first. But listen, we all have to answer that question. Do we love Jesus more than our careers, our salaries, our benefits, security, prestige, position, possessions? Do we love them, love him more than these? As we used to say in the 70s, that's heavy-duty stuff, isn't it? Well, here's the second possibility. Jesus may have been asking Peter, do, do you love me more than these? And maybe he turned and looked at the band of disciples sitting around the campfire eating fish and bread sandwiches that Jesus had prepared. You know, over these three years of being with Jesus, they had become bonded together like a real family. And these disciples have become brothers in Christ. And maybe Jesus was asking Peter, Peter, do you love me more than your brothers and maybe your family? Do you, do, will you put me before these, your, your deep, deep friends you, you love like brothers? Listen, authentic Christianity does that. It, it bonds disciples through the blood of Jesus Christ. And you become very close and attached, sometimes even closer than our, closer than our biological families. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus was speaking to a crowd. Let's read it together. 
As Jesus was speaking to the crowd, his mother and brother stood outside asking to speak to him. Someone told Jesus, your mother and brothers are outside. They want to speak to you. And Jesus asked, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he pointed to his disciples and said, look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does the will of my father in heaven is my brother, my sister, my mother. Listen, we speak about putting family first a lot in the church, and that's a truth. God wants us to be great husbands and great wives and great moms and dads and sisters and brothers, sons and daughters. Your family must come before work, career, recreation. But family, listen carefully, can never have first place. First place in our lives, our highest priority above all else must be Jesus Christ and following him. That has to be our first priority. Jesus put it very simply, Matthew chapter 10, 37. He said, if you love your father or mother more than you love me, you're not worthy of being mine. If you love your son or daughter more than me, you're not worthy of being mine. Listen, Jesus knows the greatest love a human being can have in relationship is family. And he wants us to love our families, but he requires that our love for him is even greater. Listen, we fail God. We deny Jesus when we put our love for our family before our love for him. And I need that to sink in for a moment because that has serious, serious repercussions. Some serious decisions have to be made. Will we race around as a family to sports and scouts and dance and music lessons and private lessons and travel teams and school events and concerts and tell God and others uh, that his plan for us and our family will have to wait and thing, until things calm down because family comes first. I can't serve in ministry, can't do church. I, I can't be fed the word of God. I can't, I'm just too wrapped up in family stuff. Well, Jesus said this again, Luke chapter 14, 26. If you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison, your father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. What in the world is Jesus saying here? If you could step back and graft the love for your family, it would be as high as you could possibly put it. But then if we could step back again and chart our love for Jesus, Jesus says our love has to be so much greater that if we put our love for him on the same graph, people looking at it would say, your love for Jesus is so high, your love for Jesus, you must hate your family. We don't, we love him, but we love Jesus so much more. Jesus said, Peter, do you love me more than your brothers and your family? And we have to answer that same question. Years ago, Lynn, I used to listen to Christian recording artist Steve and Annie Chapman. They were a great couple. They wrote uh, and sang songs about marriage and family. We got to see them live several times. And one of our favorite songs was called The State of the Union Address, where Steve and Annie Chapman would take turns singing about their love and commitment to one another. One of the greatest lines in the whole song and truth in the song was this, this lyric. The spouse, uh, Annie sang to, to Steve, sang, Steve sang this to Annie. I find the more you give yourself to him, to God, the more you have left for me. That's the secret of loving your family. If you want to love your spouse and family the best you can, put God first. Love him more. And his love will overflow in your heart to your family. And they'll be blessed by it. You can count on that. Now, here's the third possibility. Do you love me more? Then the other disciples love me. Peter, despite your failures and weakness, do you love me more than the other disciples love me? Listen, are you more committed than the rest? Are you going to be average like all the rest? Are you going to uh, be satisfied with mediocrity? Uh, or do you love me more than others love me? And Jesus wasn't trying to trick Peter into being his old, prideful, boastful, arrogant self before denying Jesus. No, Jesus re was restoring the rightful passion Peter would need to totally radically follow Jesus Christ. And Peter said, I love you, Jesus, more than anyone or anything else, including my own life. I will not be average. I will love you more. See, Jesus was spurring Peter on. Peter, will you love me beyond the average person who doesn't really think they need me that much? Huh? Will, will you rise above the mediocrity of the average Christian, the average disciple? And instead, would you radically, passionately, and purposely love me and follow me with all that you have and all that you are? We have to answer that question every day. If we don't want to fail and 
and, and fall. Listen, do you want to be an average Christian or do you want to love Jesus more? And folks, when we, we choose average, I, I believe we're copping out on God. We're, we're denying him. We're failing him. For instance, the average disciple in the United Methodist Church, that's the tribe I belong to, gives about 1.3% of their income instead of tithing 10% as God outlines in his word. Are you satisfied being average or do you love Jesus more than that? And are you concerned you might be robbing God? That's what the prophet Malachi told the Jewish people who weren't tithing as God's law demanded. Statistics tell us, again, the average disciple in the United Methodist Church spends their whole life and never leads one person to give their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ. Never praise, never praise the sinner's prayer with someone to receive Christ. That's average. Do you want to be average? Statistics tell us the average United Methodist congregation goes decades without adding one new Christian by what we call profession of faith. In other words, a person who's given their hearts to Jesus Christ for the first time. Most Methodist churches go decades without doing that. Listen, our assignment from God is the Great Commission to go make disciples of all the nations. Are we satisfied with being average? Does, does Jesus ask us, do you love me more than average? Sure he does. A new Barna survey shows that 7 out of 10 Americans claim to be Christians and followers of Jesus Christ, but only 3 out of 10 attend worship. <laughs> That's average. <laughs> You know, we look at God, we say, Lord, I shared my faith as much as others around me. I gave what others gave. I prayed as much as most Christians prayed. I came to worship every now and then. I was average like the others. Do you think average disciples will hear Jesus say, well done, my good and faithful servant? Do you think average will change the world? Well, what spurs us on to love Jesus more than average? Well, Jesus told a story, a parable. He said, a man loaded money to two people. 500 pieces of silver to one, 50 pieces to the other, but neither of them could repay. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Then Jesus asked the question, who do you suppose loved him more after that? Well, of course, the one who forgave the greater debt. How many sins has Jesus forgiven in your life? Would that cause you to love him more? In another example, Jesus was eating uh, with a Pharisee and a woman of ill repute rushed in washed his feet with her tears, dried him with her hair. The Pharisee was aghast, thinking if only he knew who that was at his feet. And Jesus, sensing their thoughts, he said to them, he said, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. Again, how much has Jesus forgiven you? A lot or just a little? Peter, or let's fill in our own names. Bill, will you dare to love me? with a passion and a zeal that lifts you beyond average and mediocrity. And like the most Christians, you know, <laughs> I think we fail God when we love him average, like most people. I don't want to be an average Christian. Do you? I don't want to be a casual believer. I don't want to be a mediocre disciple. I, I want hell to get nervous every time I wake up in the morning. Like, oh no, Bill's awake. Now we're in trouble. I want heaven to be happy when I wake up. I want God to use my failures and my falls, and I have lots of them to, to pull me closer to him in love and devotion. And that's what Jesus was doing with Peter. That's what he wants to do with you and me. Draw us deeper in devotion and commitment and passion for him. Well, what about others? What if others think, uh, what if others don't get it, why I'm so passionate? What if others think I'm just a fanatic? What if, what if, what if others, what, what will they think about me? Well, it's not about others. <laughs> It's about you and your relationship with Christ, your love for him, your commitment to him. After this exchange, this wonderful exchange, the three questions and three answers, Peter turned around, let's read this together, and saw behind them the disciple Jesus loved. That's John, by the way, he's writing this gospel. Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? And Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive till I return, what is that to you? It's for you, follow me. In other words, Jesus was saying, Peter, don't worry about the others, what they do or don't do. If they're sold out for me, great. If not, that's not your business. It's between me and them. But for you, love me more and follow me. J. Oswald Sanders left a very promising law practice in his native New Zealand to serve as an instructor and administrator. 
at a Bible college in New Zealand. In 54, 1954, he became the general director of the China Inland Mission and led to the reorganization of that uh, overseas missionary and became the Overseas Missionary Fellowship. He was instrumental in bringing, bringing many new missionaries and mission projects throughout all of East Asia. He retired in 1969. He continued to teach and uh, write prolifically, authored over 40 Christian books about faith and discipleship, many being translated in German, Chinese, Korean, Spanish, French. And he wrote this, and I, I think it's, it's just profound, simple but profound. Read it with me. You're as close to God as you want to be. How close do you want to be? Just enough to get by? Just to squeeze yourself into heaven? Or despite your failures and your flaws and your weaknesses, do you want to be fanning the flames of passion and devotion for Jesus? Are you compelled to go deeper and farther into the realms of his love and kingdom? Listen, Jesus asked Peter, and he's asking us now, do you love me more than these? What are the more than these in your life and your walk? And are will you willing to say, yes, Lord? I do. I love you more than these. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are challenged to step out of mediocrity, to, to rise up out of being average. We don't want to be average. We want to hear you say passionately to us, well done, good and faithful servant. God, we want to love you more, more than our occupation. We want to love you more than uh, the things around us. We want to love you more than, than the average Christian. We want to love you more. Follow you all the way radically, changing our world. Lord, we 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 apologize. We, we, we ask your forgiveness for putting our family first. We do love them, and you want us to love them, but you want us to love you more. And if we do that, we'll end up loving our family more. So God just Take us where we are like you did with Peter and bring us to where you want us to be. We're willing and ready and, and, and able to follow you that way. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he establish your heart in peace. Love him more than these. Whatever the these are in your life, occupation, career, family, maybe even other Christians, will you rise up and love them more? God bless you. See you next time. Amen.